Alexander, shall I start? Yes, please, David. Sorry, David, what, who doesn't need an introduction? <laughs> please start. That's fine. So I'm going to talk about the possible surge of public interest in biomarkers of aging. So that if we come back to this conference in four or six years time, we won't be having the same old discussion. Oh, we wish there could be a moonshot project. Already there will be a change in public attitude. I'm gonna take a little bit of a futurist attitude in here. And by futurist, I don't just mean predicting something that might happen in the future, looking ahead to a desirable end goal that I guess all of us in this call probably share that there will be at some stage comprehensive, effective longevity therapies, inexpensive in wide use. And we might imagine optimistically 2040, pessimistically 2140. No, I'm not just gonna talk about that. I'm gonna use the technique of back casting. That's a rather grand name for a simple idea, which is that we must look in the intermediate time scale. What kinds of things do we need to consider for the short term that will increase the likelihood of that desirable end future happening sooner rather than later? One possible intermediate goal, of course, is that there is a lot more funds invested in this area, private money and public money but we have to back cast again. What's going to make that increase in funding possible? And that takes me to the possible influence of celebrities, or we might call them key influencers. So let me just ask you to indulge me for a minute in a bit of fantasy. If we look ahead five or six years, people like, I wonder if you recognize this group here. This is the Beckham family. David Beckham is a famous soccer player, a football player. His wife, Victoria Beckham, used to be known as Posh Spice. Where's this going? Bear with me. The Spice Girls, for those of you old enough, you might remember them as, in some ways, the most popular and successful all-girls group ever. They still have more records sold than any other such group. What's happened to Victoria Beckham? Well, she now has a beauty business. And on that beauty page today, you can buy something. It's quite expensive, a cell rejuvenating power serum which is claimed or suggested isn't just a cosmetic. In some ways, it actually rejuvenates the skin. And if you click on that, you will find various claims about chemicals that sort of might have been mentioned at our conference today. Niacin AMI does such and such. Fragmented hyaluronic acid does such and such. Well, does this really rejuvenate the skin? hold that question. Another possible celebrity, you may not know this person. He is a professional golfer. He is 27 years old. His name is Bryson DeChambeau. I am picking him in part because he has recently done something that only two other professional golfers have done. Even if you don't know much about golf, you might know one of these. Two people who have done the same thing. Tiger Woods dominated professional golf for much of the last 20 years. And the golden bear, Jack Nicholas, was sort of in the same role for the previous 20 years. And all three of them have uniquely won the three particular championships, the U.S. University Golf Championship, the U.S. Amateur, and most recently, the U.S. Open. Why am I telling you about Bryson DeChambeau? Well, his fellow golf professionals nickname him the professor. He applies lots of mathematics and physics and biology in his approach to golf. He has made all his golf clubs the same length, defying conventional wisdom. He talks about mathematics a lot and he has created his own diet that in the last few months, actually in this year, has put on 20 pounds worth of muscle, which means he now hits the ball incredibly hard and incredibly fast. Uh, why am I telling you this? Well, he has explained his diet in an interview in GQ magazine recently. My goal, he says, is to live to 130 or 140. I think that's possible now. 
well, I think he's wrong there, of course, but he's more plausible when he goes on to say, I think that somebody's going to do it in the next 30 or 40 years. I want humans to be better. I want them to succeed, he says. And the rest of golfers are divided about this uh, new approach. Some of them say it's not golf in the way that we British might say it's not cricket. Others are more humanitarian minded. They wonder, is this really good for his health? Beating up his muscles like this, might it actually foreshorten? And that brings me to the main point. We have to back cast again before public as a whole can evaluate credibly what claims people like Posh Spice, Victoria Beckham, or Bryson DeChambeau, people with a great deal of influence and clout, what they may be saying, we need to raise public interest in credible biomarkers of aging, things that can be measured and can tell us whether these therapies are working. So I'm envisioning in a number of years that when people meet together, they won't just talk about current statistics, they will be sharing, hey, here's my biomarkers of aging. Oh, here's my biomarkers of aging. Or oh, you should see my girlfriend's biomarkers of aging. Wow, really indeed. And bear in mind, we do, we humans do like to exchange information about statistics, whether it's sports statistics, golf, professional football, ice hockey, whatever, music statistics. Increasingly, we are aware that our financial credit worthiness influences a lot of what we can do and not do. Some of us still talk about horoscopes or modern versions of that, personality types, preferred learning styles, sexual orientation. And yes, there are some discussion of health statistics such as blood pressure, cholesterol. But I'm here to raise the possibilities that we will be talking in a few years time. And when I say we, I mean the general public or more parts of the general public about their effective biological age. And I agree, by the way, with Walter Crompton, who raised the possibility in chat that we might need more than one such metric. So what would the implications be if that were to happen? As uh, Alexander Zavronkov already suggested it could have implications in insurance premiums. More and more people might hear if you want to lower insurance. Well, today you can get a lower insurance in some cases as a car driver if you agree to put some new technology in your car that monitors your driving. In the future, you might get a lower insurance premium if you can prove that your effective biological age is younger than the norm. We might use it to evaluate potential long-term romantic partners. Companies might use it to evaluate employees ahead of giving them a significant new responsibility. And critically, we may start changing our own behavior or influencing those who we love to change their behavior because we know what our effective biological age is and we can already see what changes we can take part with in order to reduce it. Is this all upsides? Well, as a futurist, I want to counsel everybody to think about their downsides as well. What could go wrong if there is, for a while at least, some widespread interest in effective biological age? We might anticipate some opposition to it. We might say people saying, don't discriminate against us, please, just because our effective biological age is older. I'm not so worried about that. I think we could win that argument. It's different from ageism. Ageism is when people are discriminated against just because of their chronological age. There might be more sense in discriminating against people who have large, inflated, effective biological ages. Then there might be disillusionment, a hostile backlash, first of all, against therapies which don't deliver the changes in effective biological age that they promised. I'm not too worried about that either. It's actually good if we can catch out therapies for not doing what they promise. It's good if we know that quickly. The bigger backlash and the more dangerous one might be if the biomarkers turn out to be bad predictors of mortality, not just in a few individual cases, but statistically as well. So we do need to do. What Sven has already been arguing, we need to evaluate the various biomarkers from a number of criteria. And in addition to the criteria he listed, I would want to list these uh, socially uh, normative criteria too. 
and very briefly to look at how innovations spread throughout society. Here I'm drawing on quite old work by Geoffrey Moore, but I think this, uh, this is still very relevant. People in society vary uh, in how well we are interested in crazy new ideas such as biomarkers of aging. There is an initial group of which almost all of us in this call belong. We care about things because, hey, they're cool, they're neat ideas, and they might, if we work hard, be helpful for us. What Jeffrey Moore points out is there's a big gulf, a chasm, before more ordinary people, real people, or mainstream people will adopt these new ideas. They want something that's simple to use. They want something that's got good usability. They want something that many of their colleagues, their social friends, their celebrity that they like, that they are already using. People who in some sense they feel are like them. And if you can get it right, Jeffrey Moore argues we must find a few killer apps, something that will appeal to some of these people in the majority, and then it can cascade with more people like them, seeing that their friends are talking about biomarkers of aging, and they will start getting involved too. Thus, if we get it wrong and there's a backlash, there can be a cascade of negativity as well. Which takes me to my conclusion. I think it would be great if we can enable a surge of public interest in biomarkers of aging, but to do that, we need to be sure that we can communicate them well, including their drawbacks. They must be sustainable in the sense that we're not gonna change our minds about them, and we must avoid the adverse publicity. And to make them successful, we tie them with applications with real world relevance, known as killer applications, perhaps insurance, perhaps as Aleske Moskolov mentioned, there might be some indication to your likelihood of being vulnerable to a COVID infection. Or as I've seen on Twitter, a suggestion by David Doherty, they could be relevant in other animals like the field of horse racing in which huge money is invested. And if people find out that biomarkers of aging could be applicable to the uh, treatments given to horses, then it could surge there well and then be copied back into human treatments. So insurance, uh, COVID, uh, horse racing, and possibly others. And if we can do that, then we, we may well inspire these key influencers who are not at this conference today, but who might talk to their very large followers on Instagram, Twitter, and elsewhere about the importance of this. And we can therefore change the public landscape with more and more funds then being directed profitably to this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for this, um, for your inspiring talk and also for keeping the time. There are actually no questions, but a lot of answers from Didier. So you might take a look in the, in the chat. Um, 